Hey there, and welcome to The Haunted Chest, where I talk about overlooked, underrated, or underappreciated games you might not have tried, because nothing's scarier than being forgotten. Wow, that was kind of dark. I'm a big fan of October. It's a month full of spooks, scares, and all things horrific. I just love the atmosphere of it all. But when it comes to utilizing all that terror, few companies can compete with Capcom. I mean, have you seen Street Fighter the movie? A single boat against everything he's got? The pilot would have to be out of his mind. Luckily, Bison has driven me crazy. Quick! Change the channel! Oh yeah, and they also made Resident Evil, Darkstalkers, Devil May Cry, Dead Rising, and Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. But before all of that, they made a little classic called Ghosts and Goblins. So in this game, you're running around in your undies getting grabbed by the ghoulies. It's a grand old time. But eventually you run into one of these guys, the Red Armors. And Jesus Christ are they annoying, is what I would say if I'd ever played a Ghosts and Goblins game before. But I have not. Probably get around to that. Well, anyway, someone at Capcom thought it would be a good idea to give this guy a game for whatever reason, and thus, Gargoyle's Quest was born. And wouldn't you know it, the game did very well both critically and financially, prompting Capcom to create Gargoyle's Quest 2, and eventually, Demon's Crest. But before we get into the nitty gritty, it looks like we have some exposition. In the world of demons, there exist six magical stones, inscribed with the crests of fire, earth, air, water, time, and heaven. These stones grant immense power, so naturally a civil war erupted and demons began to destroy one another in pursuit of them. But in the end, series main character Firebrand defeated all comers and collected five of the six stones. Eventually, he challenged a mighty dragon for the final crest and won. Battered and weakened from the fight, however, he was ganked by this chump and lost all of them. As you would guess, it's now your quest to reclaim the stones and kick this guy right in the Beelzebubs. It might be a little bit cliche, what with the treasures of the elements and all, but you're about to see why Demon's Crest is one of my favorite SNES games, as well as my favorite brand of toothpaste. So, what's this game all about? Well, the second you click start, I think you'll get a pretty good idea. Oh wow, that's intimidating. Oh god, I don't even know the controls yet! Ah, ooh, e. Okay, I did it. Let's get out of here. Oh, come on! Okay, I did it again. Oh dear. Two things to note, this game is delightfully macabre. And also, this game wants your cone head on a silver platter and will likely receive it on multiple occasions. In order to help you avoid this, your moveset consists of fireballs, headbutting things, clinging to walls, and the ability to indefinitely hover left and right. It's all silky smooth, and you catch up on it really quickly despite there being no tutorials. That's probably good game design. Well, after beating the dragon, you're thrust into the first level, and it's so freaking fun. You get to incinerate clansmen, slam your face into rocks, slam your face into more rocks, kill this hippogriff thing, slam your face into a hippogriff-shaped rock. Eventually, you run into this guy, Arma. He's a lackey of the big bad and your rival throughout the game. He's a tricky little bugger, but every time you beat him, he gives you back one of the crests. Earth, this time. What do they do? Well, allow me to demonstrate. Yep, one of this game's biggest mechanics is transformation. This here is the ground gargoyle. While you lose the ability to fly and headbutt stuff, your fire now turns into a powerful shockwave and you can destroy things by ramming into them. Though oddly it doesn't hurt enemies for some reason. Oh hey, the earth really is flat. Can't wait to tell my friends at the society. Well, this is the overworld, and it's awesome. Here you'll notice that the game gives you a ton of freedom in regards to level progression. There are two new areas now, and each one has an alternate path that leads to an entirely new area. I chose to start with level two, and interestingly, this place also contains what could be considered the game's hub. It's filled with all kinds of shops. 
They sell things like potions and spells, but you need the proper collectibles if you want to use them. Oh yeah, items are an important part of this game. I guess I should probably talk about them. Well, there are heart containers, pretty self-explanatory. There are vellums. These things can store spells you buy at stores. But like, I'm pretty sure most of them kind of suck. Like, I'm not even sure if the first two actually do anything. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum are urns. These things let you store potions, and they are extremely useful. Well, some of them still suck, but the ones that don't are great. Sulfur immediately lets you teleport to the overworld, which is a real time saver. And herb and ginseng heal you, and given the game's difficulty, yeah, you better chug that stuff. And finally, the last items you can collect are called talismans. Each one gives you a passive effect when equipped, like getting more money. If you get one, go to the old man in town and he'll tell you what they do. How considerate. The game could almost be considered a Metroidvania, albeit a bit more straightforward, considering many of these items require power-ups you might not have yet, so keep an eye out for anything that seems suspicious. Speaking of suspicious, you can gamble all your money away at this headbutting minigame. The timing is incredibly precise though, and I suck at it. But rumor has it there are two even harder difficulty challenges hidden in the overworld. The hardest one may even give you a heart container if you beat it, so keep your eyes peeled. Well, this level is pretty straightforward. Hold on a second, I think my heart just stopped. Okay, really, I love this game's tone and art style. It's more gothic than this painting. Well, that isn't that bad. Oh, consider me spoof. Like that dragon at the beginning of the game. It could have just been some regular old dragon, but its skin is melting off, the wings are falling to pieces, its rib cage is exposed. You can even see what I can only assume are its heart and intestines. Ugh. This game's music insinuates this atmosphere well. It's delightfully dark and eerie, and when it comes to setting the mood, it's second to none. Wait, what is that thing? Well, I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about boss fights, because this game has quite a few of them. Each one is unique and challenging in their own way, and you'll end up dying a lot to them. Luckily, you have infinite lives, so this isn't much of a problem, and each boss telegraphs their attacks, leading to each encounter being fair and satisfying to overcome. Though there are some exceptions, like this hairy piece of garbage. I seriously can't find any way to reliably fight this thing, so in the end I just ended up tanking the thing's attacks with one of the transformations you get later on. But I won't spoil it. But here are some transformations I will spoil. The aerial gargoyle gives you a razor sharp wind cutter attack and freedom of flight. The tidal gargoyle is pretty much useless on dry land, but underwater its attack is wicked powerful. Not to mention other gargoyle forms just kind of die underwater. You can even find pieces of the fire crest, which is the one you start with. Each piece gives your default form a new type of fireball, though with the exception of Buster, each one's usefulness really depends on what order you find them. Transformations tend to replace them as they're earned. Oh look, a castle just showed up. It isn't labeled like the other levels though. That's odd. Let's check it out. Do not do this. Going into the castle before getting all the crests and beating what's inside actually, and without warning, gets you the bad ending. And then after getting the bad ending, you just stay at the ending screen forever. Now, this might not seem so bad, but this game doesn't have a save system. Rather, it uses passwords to keep progress. And you can only get these passwords once you quit the game. So, if you're playing this game in a long session and go into the castle, and why wouldn't you, you would have to start the whole game over. Luckily, I had a password from like one level ago, so I didn't lose much progress, but it did give me quite a scare. So yeah, this game has multiple endings, and you get the good ending if you go to the castle after collecting five of the six crests. But, you can also get the complete ending. To do this, not only do you need five of the six crests, but you also have to collect all the heart containers, urns, vellums, talismans, and fire powers. Doing so gives you a code that unlocks an awesome new gargoyle form and a secret final final boss, and it is absolutely ridiculous. Seriously, I wouldn't recommend going after this ending unless you're really hardcore. 
Collecting everything was quite a hassle, honestly. And I'm not kidding when I say the secret boss is absolutely sadistic. Like, the regular final boss is already insanely hard, but this guy is so hard that I can't even think of a proper joke to describe how hard it is. But you want to know a really funny joke? Not trying this game out. <laughs> This classic is absolutely amazing, with extremely tight controls, really satisfying difficulty, and an amazing level of style. There isn't much not to love, besides a bit of item imbalance and a cheap end of the game that you now know to avoid. So, what of the future of Firebrand? Does he have any hope for a new game? Yeah, no. Demon's Crest is unfortunately the last game in this trilogy, and it looks to stay that way. Even Ghosts and Goblins, the far more recognizable series this trilogy was spun off from, has remained criminally underused these days. Capcom is far too busy pumping out half-baked fighting games to focus on any of that noise. Though speaking of which, Firebrand is actually a playable character in the new Marvel vs. Capcom games. Though his moveset is mostly derived from his stint as an enemy, rather than a protagonist, at least the series' legacy lives on in a way. If you want to give this game a shot, you can purchase it for the SNES if you're drowning in excess cash, or a more cost-effective option is to get it for the Wii U, or even the new 3DS. You won't regret it. And as for the first two games in the series, well, I'll get to them some other day. Probably.